So you've got your, your materials that are literally being assembled by the fungus. And at the other end, you've got a useful material, like a packaging material or insulation for your house. And um, because you've basically got a biological organism doing all the manufacturing for you, it's really sustainable and it's really cheap. Welcome back to Responsible Impact, a production of Magic Links. We connect brands and influencers, and so this is the show where we take a good look at all things sustainability and e-commerce. One of the big hang-ups that most of us face when it comes to sustainability is that we're really hooked on using materials which aren't super great for the environment. This is where researchers come in. Their insights into alternatives are illuminating a host of exciting possibilities, and in listening to Dr. Mitchell Jones, it turns out that for many sustainable materials, the answer just might be mycelium. The term polymer is also going to come up a lot, and as a reminder, polymers are made up of repeating monomers, which is roughly like saying that Lego projects are built out of individual repeating Lego blocks. The finished shape is made of subunits, and together, they do really cool stuff. Last but not least, outside the US, what we call siding on a building, Australians call cladding. On that note, I'll let Dr. Jones take you through the rest. So my name's Mitchell Jones. I currently work at TU Wien, the Vienna University of Technology, in the Department for Structural Polymers. I did my PhDs in uh, one in uh, at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia, in mechanical engineering and the joint PhD in uh, materials chemistry at the University of Vienna in Vienna. Uh, and I now work in the areas of sustainable materials, recycling, and tribology. Can you give us a quick definition of mycelium? Yeah, of course. So mycelium is the collective noun for hyphae. Basically, a hypha, the singular, is more or less the root-like structure, the vegetative growth of the fungus. So if you can imagine what you have buy from the supermarket, that is the fruiting body. So fruiting body is the term for this, basically the, the umbrella term. And then mushroom is belonging to a specific taxonomy of the, the fungi. So not all fungi are having mushrooms per se. But basically what you're buying is the fruiting body and the root-like structure that that grew from, that that fruited from, is mycelium as a collective noun made up of hyphae. So lots of these hypha. And uh, these are originating from a spore typically. So you have a spore, then you have a hypha, hyphae, which is a mycelium, and then from that you get your fruiting body, which is what you're eating. How would you visually describe it? It's really, it looks a lot like roots, but very, very fine roots, uh, typically white, and you can imagine it basically interlacing uh, either wood or earth, or even, even like a spider web would be a good sort of visual medium to mm. picture what this looks like. A lot of folks are going to be like, fungus, what, you know, you mean the mushrooms that I eat. So if you want to give a real quick, like explain like I'm five introduction, go for it. Um, so it's a, it's a big mistake to really correlate fungi in any way with plants because they are actually a completely separate kingdom with up to 5.1 million different species estimated. You, you can't really compare them to any other kingdom. They are their own kingdom, but they're actually really closer to animals than they are to plants because they actually have a heterotrophic growth process, not a photosynthetic one. So they basically excrete enzymes, which breaks down biological material. Then they absorb the nutrients back into them. So you can sort of say that they have an external stomach in a way. Um, obviously, they play a really intimate role in our everyday lives that a lot of people don't really think about. Obviously, everybody sees the mushrooms that they eat, which are typically limited to just one species. So most of the time, what you buy in the supermarket is a white button mushroom, Agaricus bisporus. But really, a large proportion of the fungi out there go unnoticed by your, your average person. That said, 
they're used in antibiotics. Uh, yeasts are used a lot in fermented food and beverages. We have meat substitutes or sort of protein sources derived from fungi. But we're, we're really interested in the materials science aspect of it. So the materials science aspect of fungi is also quite old, but from a negative perspective in that often they have been studied because they are basically degrading wood. And obviously we use wood for a lot of structures. Our area, this new area, which is about 10 years old, um, mycelium composites, and also uh, there are a few supplementary areas that stem off this main area that are a little bit uh, newer. So for example, like mycelium derived leather, membranes uh, for filtration applications, wound dressings, paper and paper-like materials. This is all based on the concept that we take low-value materials, typically low-value agricultural or forestry residues like rice hulls, molasses, whey, sawdust, all these kinds of things, and we basically upcycle them into useful materials, things like packaging materials. You've got things like insulation materials, both thermal and acoustic insulation. Um, and the plus side of this is this is also a really environmentally sustainable and cost effective process because fungi are not photosynthetic, so they don't need light. You just basically you're going to have them growing it uh, under ambient conditions with no real energy input, basically. So you've got your, your materials that are literally being assembled by the fungus. So waste one end, well, not waste, but a uh, byproduct at one end, and at the other end, you've got a useful material, like a packaging material or insulation for your house. And um, because you've basically got a biological organism doing all the manufacturing for you, it's really sustainable and it's really cheap. Th that's basically what, what we're looking at. That's our interest, the materials science aspect of it. Maybe let's start first with sort of the wound treatment aspects of it. Um... You mentioned, or you mentioned, one of the papers talked about it um, bonding to negatively charged surfaces like wounds. I didn't realize wounds were negatively charged. I talked about like mixing it with things like bentonite that are absorbent, dealing with scarring, styptic properties. All of that was fascinating to me. And feel free to touch on as much of that as you want. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. I'm sorry. I can break it no, down. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you asked. Okay. Um, you know, these, these sorts of things are always a rabbit hole, you know, that you, you can really go really deep with a lot of these things. The more, the, the, the deeper you go, the more there is, is often the case. Basically, fungi contain a structural polymer called chitin in their cell wall. So you have, obviously, most people, I think, know cellulose, which is the most abundant natural polymer on Earth. It's what you find in wood pulp. It's what you find in plants. Chitin is the second most abundant. And basically, it's also in a lot of natural organisms. So, for example, in crustaceans, so crabs and lobster in their, in their exoskeleton, they, that's chitin. In insect exoskeletons and cuticles, butterfly wings, all this kind of stuff, you've got this polymer chitin. And chitin is basically makes up a, a, a significant portion of the cell wall of fungi, of mycelium and the fruiting bodies as well. Now, chitin itself does not necessarily have significant medical properties, but there's a derivative of chitin called chitazan, and this has some amazing medical properties. For starters, it's normally fibrous, so it's it's fibrous that you can use as a barrier to prevent contaminants, to prevent impurities from entering a wound. So this fibrous morphology is, is already a really attractive property of these materials. Also, they sometimes basically make a composite wound dressing where they will include mineral clays or nanoparticles in the dressing with the chitazan to sort of basically try to beef up the antibacterial properties of it. Um, but in itself, it, it acts as a hemostatic agent, so it basically will reduce the, the blood flow, will stem bleeding more or less. Obviously, it has antibacterial uh, properties. 
and it also has some really cool support functions for human cells. So it will actually support their proliferation and attachment at the wound site. And from this sort of perspective, it can actually actively accelerate healing and reduce scarring in a way that is not necessarily that common. You can do so many different things with this, with this fungal chitin. It's quite incredible. How about next up, let's talk about sort of mush mushrooms in air quotes, mushroom leather, anywhere you want to dive in, because I think all of it is super fascinating. Okay, so it's worth noting right from the beginning that mushroom leather is a vague term because we have had something called armadou leather or German felt for a very long time. There are some communities in Romania uh, that still make this very traditional leather-like material produced from fungal fruiting bodies. And we say leather-like material and not leather because leather is a term that is exclusively reserved for animal hides. Uh, so when we talk about a material, we, we talk about it as a leather-like material or a leather substitute. Now, this particular leather substitute, as I say, has been around for I think at least 6,000 years, uh, they found a, a caveman in, a, in a, the, sort of the, the remains of a caveman um, that, that possessed some of this material. So this German felt or, or armadou leather, some families still make it and sell it uh, on a small scale in Romania. Uh, and this is basically produced by taking uh, the fruiting bodies of a particular fungus and basically processing them, manually processing them into a, more of a, like a carving process, basically into a leather-like material. Now, the, the new leather-like material, the one that everybody's all excited about and is sort of the, the, the new, uh, just sort of no more than five years old, is basically derived from the mycelium. So not from the fruiting body, but from the mycelium. And... In order to make this material, what they are basically doing is they are taking, uh, well, th there are a number of ways, but one method is a solid state fermentation process where they basically take, for example, sawdust and they put it in a tray, a shallow tray. Then they basically inoculate it with fungus and they allow the fungus to grow, but they maintain a carbon dioxide rich atmosphere around the fungus as it's growing and because fungi are aerobic so they need oxygen the fungus will basically grow outwards in order to try to find oxygen without producing any of these fruiting bodies or spores that would potentially ruin this mat so what these manufacturers are after is a, a very sort of homogeneous even mat of mycelium, so the root-like structure, all knitted together. And, and hence, they're using this, this carbon dioxide environment to basically prevent faults in the mat. Once they've got these mats, they're basically treating them. And once they have processed this material to give those leather-like mechanical properties, they are typically dyeing it uh, and, for example, embossing it. So they can emboss it with a, a pattern to give it some texture. In this way, they can effectively produce a leather-like material from fungi for actually a, a very reasonable cost. From what I'm hearing, it sounds to be that it's around the same cost. Uh, they, they expect to sell it for around the same market price as a, a good leather. And this is actually something that's taken off since we published our latest review on it. Adidas is actually working with uh, some of the manufacturers to bring this uh, fungi-derived leather light material to their shoes by 2021, so next year. So this is, it's all pretty fresh and it's all happening. So it may well be something that the consumers are actually seeing pretty soon. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Um, apparently leather once, once, well, hide once it's tanned and becomes what we think of as leather is more or less sort of mummified and doesn't biodegrade the way that we would imagine it would for being an animal byproduct. Um, does the, the coloration or the preservation process on these leathers, these mushroom leathers, do you know, these new mushroom leathers, uh, does that meet with the same sort of end of life 
mummification process or is it still biodegradable? Do you know? So, uh, well, okay. Um, so I would say I keep that... asking these questions that make you say, no, okay. no, no. I love these questions. <laughs> They're really good questions. I love. Oh, good. Questions. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, no. So I would say that bovine leather, you would anyway, probably classify it as biodegradable. So yes, yes, they are treating it, they are tanning it, and, and it is becoming a lot more robust, a lot more resistant to aging. But this is still a material that would be at the end of the day, fairly biodegradable. It might take a while to break down, but it's not going to have any real significant issues that you might sort of see with, you know, if you were making it from a synthetic polymer. So, you know, when, when you've got these other synthetic uh, leather substitutes like polyvinyl chloride or um, polyurethane uh, leather substitutes. Obviously, these have big end-of-life problems in terms of biodegradability. Bovine leather, traditional animal leather, does not really have that problem. It is pretty biodegradable. The fungi leather is also treated, as you say, and it certainly becomes more robust in the same way that the animal leather does. So through desiccation and some other processes, it's basically more resistant to aging, more resistant to weathering. So I would say it has a similar probably biodegradability to bovine leather, which anyway is, I would say, fairly biodegradable. The issue that may arise would be that some companies, so I should say that none of the companies are very forthcoming when it comes to providing information about their products. They're all fairly closed on in that respect. Uh, so I don't know if this applies to all of the fungi leathers, Fair. but some of the fungi leathers that are being made now, these mycelium based ones, they are actually, uh, in, they're basically reinforcing it with polyester. Uh, in order to improve the mechanical properties to to be really good. Um, and when you do this, when you reinforce with polyester, then actually, of course, the, the fungal-derived component remains biodegradable, but the polyester certainly isn't. So this is sort of like a composite leather then. I'm fairly confident that not all of the manufacturers are using this process. I think it's just I think it's just one, maybe two. Um, but if this is the case, then there are issues with the biodegradability. But if the manufacturer is not producing a composite leather that incorporates a synthetic polymer in it, I would say that the biodegradability is very good. And the biodegradability of bovine leather is also good. So, yes. Noted. I can't believe somebody would put basically like a petroleum byproduct back into the... Did they not get the memo that we're trying to we're trying to get away? It's like when you're at a party <laughs> and you don't want to talk to somebody, and the person you're with is like, "Oh, and one more thing," and you're like, "God damn it, we're trying to leave! Like, what is happening?" <laughs> you know? Yeah. Ugh. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, from an engineering perspective, I can sympathize in that. Obviously, it's sometimes very challenging to get the properties that you require. But of course, given the fact that really the main well, really the only selling point of fungi-derived leather is the fact that it is environmentally sustainable yes. or at least supposedly more environmentally sustainable. If you are compromising that, then you really are losing your only selling point. Take me on a tour of mycelium's uses in construction and building versus, I guess, some of the drawbacks that we, we face in some current materials. Our research is basically, in, cons in the construction sector at least, is concerning mycelium composites. Mycelium composites being foam-like materials, basically. So they have a low density, they have a lot of air in them, basically. And the key applications in construction, I would think, would be insulation. It has really good thermal and acoustic insulation properties. It's actually competitive in terms of thermal insulation properties with some commercial insulators that we currently use. Uh, it has really low thermal conductivity. And acoustic-wise, it's also quite competitive with currently used commercial acoustic 
absorbers. But I would say that that's the most promising application of mycelium composites because it's something you could do right away. It, it, it's cost competitive because of the uh, really low energy, natural, biological manufacturing process that's used to construct the material. It's basically, it's really cost competitive. It's uh, obviously, it's very environmentally friendly also. It's also very cost competitive because you're using agricultural residue, which has very little value uh, in, in the construction of the material. So I would say this is, this is my favorite application. This is a really promising application that wouldn't really take much uh, effort to commercialize. Um, this is something that people could like, this is something that even with a, just a little bit of effort could be used in a few months. You know, this is the sort of thing that could be immediately commercialized and produced with fairly little fuss talking about the, the pitfalls of, of current construction materials. Perhaps one that comes to mind is that, for example, if you're going to use a synthetic polymer foam, polymeric foam as uh, insulation, either thermally or acoustically, it's really flammable. Like you're basically putting oil on your wall or inside your house. Um, and it's really, really, really flammable. I mean, we've had in Australia um, a few scandals with buildings being, uh, the cladding of buildings basically being synthetic polymeric materials. And they've had the whole building burned down. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, people at risk or maybe perhaps even injured or killed um, because they effectively put a, a highly, highly, highly flammable material as the cladding. Yeah. Um, and, and these mycelium composites can be tailored quite easily using, for example, rice hulls. So rice hulls have a significant uh, silica content, inorganic silica content um, of about 10 to 15%. Um, and they also have um, a fairly high lignin content, which is uh, aromatic. So these, the, if you include a significant quantity of rice hulls in your mycelium composite, it's uh, actually the fire safety is much better than for synthetic polymers. Mm. Um, you can also add glass fines. So when they recycle glass, uh, typically there is a... A size range that they are recycling. So if you have big pieces of broken glass, uh, it's economically viable to clean it and recycle it. However, if you have really small pieces of broken glass, so glass less than sort of a centimeter or half a centimeter in size, mm -hmm. of which there is a lot, there yeah. are, you know, tons of this uh, that they cannot recycle. They can recycle it, but it's too expensive to clean. So basically, it's not economically viable to clean uh, these really small pieces of glass. So they dump all this into landfill. Um, and you can take this. This really is a waste material. Like they'll pay you to take this stuff away. You can take this waste material, uh, incorporate it into your mycelium composite. Fungal mycelium really likes this glass. Uh, because it typically has an organic coating on it. So you might have some Coke or beer or something that was in the bottle that's basically now baked onto the glass. So the, the fungal mycelium loves to cling onto that. Uh, so you can basically disperse this glass throughout your composite, these glass fragments, and this also massively increases the fire safety of the material. It will be much, much more stable and, and much less likely to burn. We also talked, or I also uh, was reading rather, about uses in um, like food wrapping and paper and disposable diapers. Can you dive into that? Yeah, for sure. So the paper-like material applications for fungi and, and well, it either derived from the mycelium or the fruiting bodies, because both are possible, are really very expansive. When they're making paper, they are typically taking this wood, wood pulp, which is cellulose. Uh, they're suspending it. Then they're filtering it down to get a um, sort of a, a cake or a, a thin film, I would say. And then they're basically uh, pressing the water out of it. And this is paper at the end, more or less. Now, you can, you can basically do the same thing very easily with fungal chitin. And these papers are really, really cool, actually, because they have pretty incredible properties that you can achieve. So for example, just with these papers, these are much, much, much uh, stronger than 
normal paper that you so copy paper might have a tensile strength which is where you take both sides and you try to pull it apart it might have a tensile strength of say like 25 or 30 megapascals and um if you get your average mushroom from the supermarket so this common white button mushroom and you make paper out of it you can get 200 megapascals out of that what? so it's you know over six times the tensile strength and actually um that's this that's approaching the tensile strength of some steels and cast iron not only that because they have different they have different compositions in their cell walls and you can tune your paper performance anything from that really high strength to that really uh, sort of elastic behavior in terms of the mechanical properties you can do really cool stuff uh, then also because there's differences in fiber size so for the common white button mushrooms you basically got a nanoscale fibrous morphology whereas for the bracket fungi ones you've got a micro scale so you've got micro micro size fibers they fall in the micro range um, and because of these differences, you can basically get varying degrees of transparency. So from a from a really nanoscale um, network like this white button mushroom one, this really high, really high strength one, um, you can make papers that are basically transparent. Uh, whereas from the from the more elastomeric one, which has that larger uh, fiber size, uh, you can get much more opaque papers. Through bleaching and stuff like that, you can also change the color and the transparency and, and that kind of thing. But then they also have really cool surface properties. Really? Okay, keep going. So you can get really hydrophobic papers. The other cool thing is um, fungi actually basically biomineralize some salts if the fungus is in an environment where... It's exposed to, say, for example, a lot of calcium salts. Rather than letting these salts sort of have a negative effect on its growth performance, it will biomineralize. So it basically builds it into its hyphal structure in a way. And this actually makes it quite fire resistant. The paper is quite fire resistant at the end, which is pretty cool because it's paper. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. It's also really good for filtration applications. You can basically filter viruses out of, because viruses are obviously very small, but this network of fibers is even smaller. So when you push water through, you can basically filter viruses out of it. The other cool thing is that when you take chitosan, so if you take, so the, so the chitin, if you make a chitin and a paper, then this is really good for things like virus filtration. It's also really stable in terms of uh, solvent filtration. So if you want to uh, filter alcohols or stuff like that, um, it, it's really good for that. But if you then want to deacetylate it, then you give it a, a charge. And this makes it really good at attracting or chelating heavy metal ions. So, for example, you can use it to remove copper ions from water, which are a contaminant which can be dangerous to human health Ooh. and is a problem in some countries, not necessarily uh, really developed countries, but in some other countries, um, heavy metal ions in water is a really big problem. Um, so, so you can basically produce these really cool uh, filtration materials that can be used to filter out viruses, that can be used to filter out heavy metals, um, and, and all that kind of stuff. So the filtration applications are really cool. Then, as I said, you've also got in this kind of range of paper-like materials, you've also got things like leather-like materials and the wound dressings sort of also fall into this umbrella as well as course of course uh as copy paper or or normal applications that you would expect for paper uh and this of course also brings us through to packaging because um paper is is used in packaging so a huge range of different options for paper it's hard to understand why this isn't being done already <laughs> in more in more ways yeah i think I mean, it comes it comes down a little bit to the application. Yeah. And I would say that exposure goes a long way in uh, in making a difference. This fungi derived leather was definitely on the rise, I would say. Mm -hmm. But you know, we we published our article, this review paper, and this review paper was very popular. You know, it was in a very large number of really high profile newspapers and radio and TV and that. And 
I personally believe this is what it took for someone like Adidas to go, actually, this is a good idea. Maybe we should actually genuinely look into doing something with this. So the thing is, there are a lot of amazing ideas out there being peddled by people a lot more intelligent than I am. And there's only so many that can actually make it in the sort of immediate future. So a lot of it comes down to how much exposure those ideas get. And if those ideas get a lot of exposure, that's sometimes what's necessary for companies to to pick them up, more or less. And at the end of the day, I can be as enthusiastic as I like about these materials and I can tell people how great they are, but it doesn't really help at all unless someone like a big company like Adidas, for example, says, okay, actually, we're going to do something about that. Let's make our shoes out of that. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, it's a hard question to answer why nothing's been done about it so far. I think because there's a lot of good ideas out there and there's only so many that can happen at any one time. And there's only so many that uh, industry are interested in. So there you have it. I'm not asking you to treat this like multi-level marketing where you suddenly tell everyone you know, your third cousin twice removed and the person next to you at the gas station pump, but maybe do this crazy thing where you normalize talking about new ideas that could help the environment. Maybe help create buzz around something that involves solutions we all need for a problem that frankly, we're all staring down. Oh, and you know, tell people about the show while you're at it. Credits this episode go to the inimitable Hazel Shin, the ever-encouraging Brian Nickerson, the lovely Autumn Collins, and the very helpful Dr. Mitchell Jones. Please rate and subscribe to the show, and seriously, tell someone else about Fungi Derived Leather. Spread the word. All right, gang. I'm Natalie, and I'm out. Till next time.